morning. We're going to do something here over the next coming couple weeks and months and years and decades as we begin to look at some things, look at a passage here, uh, really as it relates to us, as it relates to um, our assembly. I, I kind of titled this for the web and the internet and everything, uh, The Big Picture. Uh, and, uh, and then with the colon, so as we're going to begin to look at things, and as we pay attention to some things here, as we kind of uh, get an idea of what's going on around us, and our assembly, our ambassadorship, and the impact that we have today uh, on our community around us, uh, as well as into the heavenly places, and the folks around us, and, and it's really something wonderful here and there, there's a phrase that Paul is going to use here that we're going to just kind of pick up on and look at this morning and then develop over, the, uh, over uh, the, the next coming studies. Because as we grow and as we move and as the world change, you know, the days of our lives. Wasn't that a soap opera? Or as the world turns. You know, it's like, really? Okay. You know, <laughs> anyway, we came home the other day. We left the TV on by accident, and the dogs are sitting there watching uh, General Hospital or something, you know. It's like, oh, okay, that's what the dogs do all day. They watch soap operas and uh, eat bonbons or whatever they used to say, you know. So anyway, Ephesians chapter three, if you will, look, look, look for, look here at verse seven with me, and let's just read here down to verse ten. Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now, under the principalities and powers and heavenly places, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. It's a fascinating passage there. It's a wonderful thing to understand what Paul, the goal of Paul's ministry was. If you look there at verse 7, Wherefore I was made a minister. Let your eye run back to verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, or how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now skip the parenthesis and look at verse 5. Here's what the mystery is. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister. And Paul begins to kind of lay out his, his ministry and what his ministry was to do in verse 8. His ministry there that I, in the middle of the verse, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of of Christ. His first goal, the first component of Paul's ministry was to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. That was his job. He knew that. He understood that. By the way, he did that. Then in verse 9, the second component, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And that's what we're going to be looking about, to make all men see what this, what this fellowship of the mystery is all about. When people see us out in the world and they look, you know, online or, or they come by the building and, they, and, and then they go to butnow.org. It was interesting, yesterday we streamed the, the video for some of the folks that couldn't make it for the family. And he's like, and one of the gentlemen was like, what's the website? What, how do we do this? And I said, butnow.org. And he goes, but what? <laughs> and I said, B-U-T, because he had put two T's, because autocorrect, okay? And it's B-U-T-N-O-W dot O-R-G. He goes, oh, okay, now what do we do? I said, just hit the live video and you'll be fine. But the thing is, is what does but now mean? When they look at that, what is that all about? And, and Paul says, hey, we're, there's an issue here 
that we are not only going to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, who we are in Christ, but we're going to make all men see what this fellowship is all about. Really, what is this all about? We're going to we're going to look at over the coming uh, studies about what it is to put into visible, tangible form in front of people this fellowship of the mystery. That phrase, fellowship of the mystery, is where we're going to kind of concentrate this morning. We use that a lot. You hear people talk about fellowship of the mystery and to make all men see, but really kind of need to notice this carefully here. If you look, because there's something more than just putting on display for the neighbors to see or our loved ones. But it's really also verse number 10. Notice verse 10. To the intent that, what's that word? Now. Now when? Now, now. Now means now. Now, right now, in time, this moment. August, what is today? 15th, 2021. 2021, right now, today, now, under the principality and powers, where? In heavenly places. We need to understand that our impact not only impacts the people around us, make all men see, but also there's this impact that we have that God has designed us to have up into the heavenly places, to have this impact into our future home. Our future glory, that expectation of that glorious day when we're going to reside in our new bodies in the heavenly places and function in these principalities and powers and thrones and dominions and mights and, and uh, rulers and every other name that's named. This whole thing up here, because there's something going on in verse 10. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known, notice, by the church. The local assembly is that local manifestation of the church, what we are to be doing together. The what? The manifold wisdom of who? Of God. We're a part of something that God has planned. His wisdom. Verse 11 according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're a part of something that God planned to do before he created anything. Before he, he's going to manifest some stuff. He's got some things that he wants you and I to learn about. And really what we're going to begin to see is life is more than just what you think is going on right now. What's going on right now? It's 11.20. Will the preacher be done by 12.20? Is he done yet? What are we doing for lunch? Where did I put my car keys? Where's my cell phone? <laughs> what, see, in the moment in life, we, we focus in right here. And yet, there's something that God has planned for us in a, in a cosmic manner in a broader impact that we're going to have outside of just yourself and who you come in contact. And yes, you're going to show and put on display the fellowship of the mystery, but you're also putting on display this manifold wisdom of God, and you're going to have this issue of putting it on display in time around you, but then also out into that angelic host. Angels sit in this room this morning and watch us. They're there. I know, spooky. <laughs> but they're, we're going to look at that. We're, we're going to educate them and teach them, and that's part of the plan. This morning, we're going to look at the issue of the fellowship of the mystery. That's my goal. And then next week, we'll get into the all make all men see part. Because in order to make all men see... You have to understand what the fellowship of the mystery idea is about. When we're going to put on display, by the way, to make all men see, notice it doesn't say make all men understand. You know what we usually try to do, don't we? Make everybody understand. What do you mean you don't understand right division? And then we just nail down a little harder. It doesn't say that. 
on the overhead, we have a clip about giving the gospel. Our job as ambassadors is just to give the gospel. The moment we press for an answer is the moment that we put ourselves under a performance. Because sometimes they will say what? No, thank you. And then what do we do? Okay, well, what did I say wrong? What did, and, and, and we get this guilt trip going. And our ambassadorship is to do what? What does an ambassador say? The ambassador to the UN. The United States government says this. What do we say? The word of God says this. He says all men are to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. How do you get saved? You trust Christ. And you go through the gospel. Now here's the truth. Paul's our apostle, right? And you get into it. And that's our job. It's just simply to be the proclaimer. Make all men see. Put it on display. To see it. Put it on visible, tangible, real things that they can come and touch and feel. And if you think about that, just kind of, since I'm talking about it, (laughs) you think about your life and what you do and and how you act and your attitudes about things, and you know what they begin to see? You've all heard the thing, you know, I was sitting in the bus yard one day, and I was sitting reading, and I was reading a biography on John Adams, and, uh, uh, and I was reading it, and the guy came and sat down, and he goes, what you reading? So I told him, we talked about, he didn't know who John Adams was. I'm like, how in the world can you not know who John Adams is? But anyway, so we're reading and talking about it. Well, then the next day, I was reading a black book, the Bible, because I was getting ready for some things that we were doing on a Wednesday night. And he goes, what you reading? And I said, oh, the best book in the world. He goes, really, John Adams again, huh? And I said, oh, no, <laughs> no <laughs> this is nothing. And so we got to talking, and he goes, oh, you're reading the Bible. And he began to squirm, to get up. And I said, well, before you go, let me ask you. And so we got to talking about the gospel. And he goes, oh, I believe all that. I go, really, what do you believe? Oh, I just believe every road leads back to God. And we began to talk and so forth. And that guy left mad. He was mad. And then you know what he would do? He'd see me coming down the, the, the parking lot, and he would literally go three rows over to go to his, and his bus was right next to mine. And he would wait. Is Rick backing out? You know, because he was offended by the cross. But I had the opportunity to talk to him. Your disposition, how you, display, how you put on things, how you display who you are in Christ impacts people, even the lost. They see it. And I had a guy, oh, you can't put people under the law. It's not putting you under the law. It's understanding who you are as an ambassador. As an ambassador, people watch. And you put things, you put it in real terms and tangible But before you can do all that, he says, the fellowship of the mystery. Fellowship. I don't know if you ever think about that term. Verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. If you think about the fellowship, fellows in a ship, what happens when you're on the boat together? You're fellows in a ship. Do you all share the same things? In common, the answer is yes. We had a, we used to have a little aluminum 12-foot boat. Ricky would get in it, and I'd get in it, and then we would sink. So it's too little. You know? so we, we're gonna, and you know what would happen? We would go down. We'd, we got on Canyon Lake one time, and we're going, and, and, and I leaned one way, and guess what? Ricky leaned the same way, and he's like, Dad, you can't do that. Because why? Because it put me in the water. Because, you know, it, we were too big for the little boat. So we were... What happens, you share it in common, don't you? I don't know if you've ever been on a big boat and get seasick, and you're not the only one seasick. What happens? You share things in common. You have a fellowship. You have this issue of something in common. Look at verse 6. Go back up to verse 6 here. Actually, come over. hold on here. Come over to Colossians 1. Just look over here at Colossians 1. In thinking about the fellowship of the mystery, just so you know, that word fellowship, the new Bibles will move it over to dispensation or administration. And they move it away from that word fellowship. And it's not dispensation or administration. It's what? Fellowship. Look at Colossians 1. Look at verse 25. 
Colossians 1, verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Here's the word, what? Dispensation. Do you know what the new Bibles do here? They make it fellowship. But it's not, it's what? Dispensation. So he's already begun to told, now go back to Ephesians 3. He's already begun to tell us about this issue. He's already teaching us about the issue of the fellowship of the mystery. It's what God's doing today. What is God doing today? He's forming the church, the body of Christ. He takes us and he makes us, Ephesians 3, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be what? Notice, fellow heirs. Fellow heirs. And of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Fellow heirs. If I'm a fellow heir, then what am I? A fellow member. I have fellowship. We all belong in the same boat. We're equal participants. We share everything in common. Linda and I were looking at going on that cruise a couple years ago, a year and a half ago. By the way, did you see that cruise ship today or yesterday turned up and another, a whole bunch of people had COVID and all this stuff? They're going to shut all that stuff back down. You just watch them, okay? But see, the thing is, is what happens when we, we were in the travel lady, the travel agent lady, and we're looking at the, and she says, so you can do this, and then you eat with all these people, or you do this time, and you eat with all these people. And why? Because we have a what? What do we have? We have a fellowship. We begin to share things in common. All that belongs, what does he say in Romans 8? Heirs of God and what? Join heirs with Christ. All that belongs to Jesus Christ belongs to who? All of us equally. No one is higher than the other. No one is any different than the other. Come over to Galatians 3. Galatians 3. So when we talk about fellowship of the mystery, we start with fellowship. We're all together in this equally. Galatians 3, verse 28, a tremendous passage. Galatians 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. He's making a body of who? Jews and Gentiles, bond and free, Greeks, barbarians, Scythians, the, whole, the other list where he has this, all of that. He's making one big body. And where are we? We're all in Christ. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's not about going to church. <laughs> Sorry. I'm glad you're here, by the way. <laughs> okay? Going to church doesn't make you a believer. By the way, if you think about that, does going to the garage make you a car? No. So going to church doesn't make you a believer. What makes you a believer? Trusting what Christ accomplished on Calvary as your Savior. He paid your sins, you trust Him, then He instantly gives you His identity, He gives you His righteousness, He gives you His resources, and it's no longer you having to do, He's already, our sufficiency is not in ourselves, but it is of God. And the fellowship of the mystery starts right there. It starts with your faith resting exclusively in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died and was ro and raised for you. And the moment you trust that, this issue of the fellowship of the mystery starts right there. It starts when you trust Christ exclusively. For you, your life, you know, if, I don't know if you've ever thought about your Christian life. You know where your Christian life starts? In the graveyard, in the cemetery. With who? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's where it starts. And the fellowship of the mystery begins right there because it's of who we are in Christ. 
All that we participate, come back there to Ephesians 1. You know the passage. All that we are participating in, God's forming this body of believers who rely exclusively on his son. (laughs) Think about what excites the father. Actually, who excites the father? His son does. You trust him, and you know what he says? Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. An absolute equal basis. Fellowship. The only place you will ever find absolute and total equality in this life is going to be amongst the people who are part of the church, the body of Christ. Great cry today of equality. And everybody's got to get this and everybody. And you know what? The great, the only place that you will find complete and total equality is in Christ. You will never find it anywhere else. And what you want to, you and I want to do is we want to put that on display. And all of the things of our lives, all of the daily things that you do, you want to put on display his life. That's why over the years I've talked to you over and over again about knowing who you are in Christ. Come over with me to Galatians chapter 2. Paul's goal was to preach Christ to everyone, to all, to see people get saved, and then to come along and have the doctrine, put the, put the, the life that they've received from Christ on display for all to see. Have Christ be the center. That's the fellowship. Agreement. We're all equal. The only difference from you and I is that I sit in the role of leadership. That's it. And because of that, I get no more than you, but I also get no less than you. Galatians chapter 2, in verse 7, Paul, he's meeting here with Peter and the apostles. Uh, This is Acts 15, and the the Jewish leadership in, Acts, in Galatians 2, verse 7, he says, But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. By the way, notice how Paul distinction, very distinctively makes two separate issues. Circumcision and uncircumcision. Two different messages completely. One doesn't blend into the other, and the other doesn't blend into the other. They are distinctively different. Verse 9, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, notice it carefully, perceived. They're catching on to something. They don't fully understand everything. Why? It's not their message. They're having to learn it from Paul and his writings. Ephesians 3, he's revealed it unto his holy apostles and prophets. How? By the Spirit. What was Paul doing? Writing it down. Paul gets the message right from Christ, turns around, as I wrote a four and a few words, writes it down. Then Peter gets it. Second Peter, he says over there, all of Paul's epistles, you got them. He's reading them. He's studying. He's like, wow, this is really nuts. <laughs> this is crazy. So he warns in 2 Peter 3, when you read Paul, you better be careful. There's hard things to understand in there. Why? Because watch what Paul's going to say here. He's going to say, circumcision availeth you nothing. And yet, what is big with them? Circumcision. He's going to say in Acts 13, at the end of his message, that that. Moses and the law couldn't forgive your sins and save you. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can in my gospel. And you're talking about laying a group of people out cold. And then you got some yahoos that say, well, they all preach the same message. Not when I read the verses. What does he say here? Verse 9, who perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me and Barnabas, now watch, 
the right hand of what? Fellowship. That. What is the right hand of fellowship? It's an agreement that what? We should go unto the heathen, or uh, that we, Paul and Barnabas, will go unto the heathen, and they unto who? The circumcision. What happened here? They have a, an agreement, don't they? We agree with what's going on. What's God, what is going on right now? God said the message given to Israel and the circumcision has been interrupted. I'm doing this now. Peter says it in Acts 15. God is visiting the Gentiles. We understand that. We got a history with this. Here he goes. And you know what? We're not going to put a yoke on their necks. We're going to let them go and do, and we're going to praise the Lord, and we're going to get ready because he's just visiting, and one day he's going to come back and finish out. Did I lose you? <laughs> this ought to be right. Fellows, right hand of what? Fellowship. We're in agreement on this. We're together with this. We're not going to have any arguments here. So what does Peter and the boys do in Acts 15? They send letters. And they send a group of men with Paul and Barnabas as they're going to go. So that what would happen when they come in amongst the, the Jews? There would be no misunderstanding of what Paul and them are doing. And they work that way. Come over to 2 Corinthians 6. So the right hand of fellowship here, that's the positive side. That's a good thing. They've got... Uh, they shake, they make agreements. You know, it used to be you would make an agreement with the shake of the hand. You know? Now with eight lawyers and six on the other side and eight on your side, you've got to have a contract. You know, watch Judge Judy. Come on now. You know? Uh, you know, people's court. Where's the contract? You've got to have a contract. You know, it used to be. Why? Because what was, here's my word. We're in agreement. Look at 2 Corinthians 6. Look at verse 14. Here's the negative side. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Notice the terminology, fellowship, concord, communion, agreement, all those cinnamons there, cinnamon, all of those descriptions of what? Fellowship. We have a con. these guys, by the way, you're not supposed, why? Ye are, the end of verse 16, for ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and make, and walk in them, and I will, be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Paul quoting Isaiah 52. You go back and study that out, and you know what he's saying? He's not talking about here about being in business. Be ye not, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's not about business. That's not about marriage. Chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians deals with marriage. Business, you're going to... Folks, you do business with unsaved people all day long. You just do. Why? Because you got to do business. He's talking about being a part of the religious system. I get asked all the time, in my, in my hometown there's nothing here but a bunch of Baptist churches, so I go down to the Baptist church. You know what I tell them? Stop going to the Baptist church. Oh, but they're my friends and I like the fellowship. No. Why? Because what's going to happen when you go down to the Baptist church and you're walking around and fellowshipping with them? A little leaven does what? Leavens the whole lump. Eventually, what, you're going to be persuaded not to your, where, what you believe to be true. You're persuaded to something else. Come over with fellowship. All of these terms, the working together, the life that's in Christ Jesus, our participation. Come back with me to Acts chapter 3. Our participation in what God's doing today. So if there is a fellowship of the mystery, then there is also a fellowship of prophecy. And to appreciate the fellowship of the mystery, we need to understand the fellowship of 
prophecy. Acts 3 verse 21 here, whom the heaven must re uh, receive unto the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The issue of prophecy. All right, go back to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. It's interesting when you talk to people and you say, well, the Old Testament, I hope you understand that the Old Testament doesn't start in Genesis 1-1. It actually starts in, in Exodus 19 with the commissioning of the Mosaic Covenant. That starts the Old Testament. That starts the Old Covenant. In Genesis 3, here's where prophecy starts. Genesis 3, and notice this, verse 8. Anyway, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. That's not right. Well, anyway, verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. What's going on here with Adam? Why did they hide themselves? What, did, what happened here? They've been walking with the Lord. They've been together. They've been in agreement. Sins entered into the picture here, and what did Adam do? Hid himself. Operation fig leaf. Hide. Bam. Okay. They made up themselves, some, they hid themselves from the presence of God. They were naked and they were afraid. What does religion do? What did sin do here? It broke the fellowship, didn't it? See verse 9? They're the Lord God walking in the, well, Operation Fig Leaf is in verse 7. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. It's interesting, the fig tree one of the four trees that represent the life of the nation of Israel. The fig tree represents the, the, uh, the, the, the issue of the religious life here. And you know what they did? They, took, they made religion. What's religion designed to do? Hide yourself. Cover up yourself. What did he do here? They, by the way, are fig leaves, have you ever been around a fig tree? Are they smooth and nice or are they sticky and scratchy? They're scratchy. You with me? Okay, did I lose you? I lost myself there for a moment. I found it, though. Look at, verse, look at verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. God's been walking with them. He's been talking with them. He's been communing with them. They've been in concord. They've been in fellowship. And what did sin do to that? It broke the fellowship. Now, there's disobedience on the table. Now, God's going to offer a means to Adam and Eve to restore that fellowship. If you look down at verse 21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Verse 24, So he drove out man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. When he makes them the coats of skins and he clothes them, he institutes animal sacrifice and he begins to show them about the issue of animal sacrifice. And God had a plan here of, hey, you want to restore fellowship with me? You're going to come now to me the way I want you to come. And here he institutes that issue of animal sacrifice. He takes an animal, sheds the blood makes a sacrifice, takes the skin and covers up Adam and Eve. And he does it with the coat that's gonna, that was provided by the shedding of blood. You see, he's offering a man a way back to, into what? Fellowship. Okay? Adam broke it. Sin, disobedience, broke it. Now we're going to get back into it. How do we get back into it? Animal sacrifice. The shedding of blood brings us back into. So then, what begins to happen? You're in verse 
I don't know where you're at. I don't know where I'm at either. Chapter 4. Look at chapter 4. Adam And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Verse 3, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his what? What did Abel bring? Abel brought the lamb. How did Abel know to bring the lamb? Adam and Eve have communicated the doctrine to, to the boys and said, this is what you did. What did Cain do? Cain said, I'm, not, uh-uh, I'm doing it my way. I'm bringing of my own labor instead of the labor of the lamb and the Lord. See, God had put into effect a means and a mechanism on the earth for man to fix the fellowship issue, the agreement issue. And on the earth till the flood, they, were, they had an offering of a burnt offering. Come to Exodus 19. After the flood, on your way to Exodus 19, yeah, Exodus 19. Exodus 19. By the way, that garden in Eden, eastward in Eden, that was to be a place of protection for Adam and Eve, for man. A place of protection from the adversary, from the attack. But when he broke fellowship, he disobeyed. God drives him out, puts that cherub there to keep him from the tree of life and to keep him from what? That place of protection. He lost it. God says, you're going to come to me now. This is how you're going to come. You're going to come with the burnt offering. The flood. Noah gets off the boat. What's the first thing he does? He reaches over into the seven of those clean animals. By the way, isn't it interesting that Noah had clean animals way before Exodus and, and the law and Leviticus of clean animals? Noah had them. Isn't it interesting to me? I find it interesting to me that Abraham goes in there and he offers a sacrifice and he talks with Methuselah. Or I'm not Methuselah, Melchizedek. I should have quit when I was ahead. <laughs> the headache came back. Anyway, the, the, he, he looks at Melchizedek and he offers that offering, and that's way before the law was ever established. Noah gets off, he offers a sacrifice. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sacrifices. Exodus 19, Moses has got Israel. They've been wondering. They took a 40 year, an eight day journey into 40 years. You thought Gilligan's Island was the first one with that concept, you know? And it wasn't. Every concept of, of every movie plot comes right out of the pages of God's Word. Okay? You know, you, you think about aliens. I don't know if you ever think about that. In, in, in Ezekiel, he talks about the cherubims and the wheels in the sky and the burning things and everything and his chair and all this stuff and so what do we have aliens you know anyway you guys i know i'm crazy but come on you can join me exodus 19 look at here if you will at verse number five exodus 19 5 moses has got them in the wilderness they've come up to they're going to go into the land now they're ready they're going to send 12 spies in right gets right on the land he's had five testings To prove that he's Jehovah, the five major five compound names of Jehovah. Here he is. I'm ready to do for you. And he says, verse four: Ye have seen that I did bear uh, what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which the, thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. What were they to be? That's who they were to be. Children of, they were to be his people, his kingdom of priests, his holy nation, his royal priesthood. But what do we have to establish it up? If you keep it, then you get the blessing. If you violate it and disobey, you're going to get some curses. How does Israel do? Verse 7, And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, what? We will do. Wrong answer. 
And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and be, believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the Lord unto the, unto the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people, and thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up to the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. You see, they don't have access to God anymore. They did. They were coming right. Boom, the... If then the law of the covenant, the Mosaic covenant is put in, and now what do they have got? Now they got to go to the Lord a different way. Now they got to go through the Levitical system. They failed. Rather than looking back and saying, when he says there in verse 8, and the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, what they should have said is we've learned our lesson in the wilderness. We can't do this. We need Jehovah's help. But they didn't. They said what? We can do it. You can do it. We got this. They failed. They failed badly. Come on over to Jeremiah. So what does the Lord do? Well, he sets up a system for them to come to him. Look over at Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31. He comes down. And he's going to fix it so that they can. Actually, you got Jeremiah 31. Look over at Jeremiah 3, just real quick. Same book, just a few passages back. Look at Jeremiah 3. Israel was in sin. What did sin do? Same thing it did with Adam and Eve. It broke fellowship. Look at Jeremiah 3. Very interesting passage here. Jeremiah 3, verse 6. Jeremiah 3, verse 6. The, the Lord said unto me in the days of Josiah, Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? Woo! Think he's happy? Okay. She is gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. Now here's God's attitude on religion. And I said after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. But she turned not. She's played the harlot. God is going to, God's married to Israel. They're his people. They're his bride. There's a, there's a, they have a covenant. They have an agreement. But spiritually, where are they? They're sons of Adam. They're sinners. Verse 8, and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committeth adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And it came to pass through the likeness of her whoredom, that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Woo! That doesn't sound good at all. Where is she? Where is Israel? Where is Judah? Judah, the, northern, the southern two tribes. Israel, the northern ten tribes. Where are they? They're off in apostasy. Look at verse 20. Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. The fellowship has been what? Broken because of her sin. By the way, the adultery and the whoredom, all that's religion. All that's religious. They went after other gods and they fell apart. Now come over to chapter 31, because one day, what's he going to do to her? Jeremiah 31, 31. If you, anybody, huh, by the way, in the trivia game, if anyone says, where's the, old, the New Testament and the Old Testament? Genesis 31, 31 to 34. Okay? Genesis 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a 
new covenant. Jeremiah 3, that's called a covenant of marriage that he had with them. Now he's going to make a what? A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. By the way, notice who it's made with. Not you and I, but with who? Israel and Judah. Not according to their covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they had break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest, saith the Lord. For I will, what? Forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. There's his provision. By the way, the new covenant is a grace provision. Notice who's doing all the work. He is. There's nothing Israel can do. She's broken fellowship. She's broken the agreement. And he comes along and he says, listen, I'm going to do this for you. And he, not the body of Christ, not the dispensation of grace, but I'm going to have grace on you. I'm going to have the tender mercies of David upon you. And I'm going to come and I'm going to restore the fellowship. And the centerpiece of it is Calvary. Because how can he forgive their sins? What's required? The shedding of blood. And whose blood was shed ultimately and finally? The Lord's was. So the cross sits at the center. And in that center, they have now fellowship. This will take place, just FYI, in the kingdom when he comes back. Now come over to 1 John 1 with me. Because usually when you talk about fellowship, 1 John 1 is the verses that come up. 1 John chapter 1. And we're talking about the fellowship of prophecy. We're not talking about the fellowship of the mystery. What's that? That's what God's doing today in you and I, forming the church, the body of Christ. We have all this in common. We have all this in agreement with each other. We can't lose it. It's ours. It's in the seal. It's present possession. But Israel wasn't that way. Look at, look at 1 John 1. Look at verse 1. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifest, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. 1 John 1, 1 John is written by John. Galatians 2.9, who gave Paul and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship? Peter, James, and John. John. Peter, James, and John said we're going to who? Circumcision. First John is written to who? Circumcision. That's who we're talking about. Remember that, please. Verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declared unto you that ye also may have, what? Fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Notice carefully. How are they going to get back into fellowship with Christ? They lost it, didn't they? They messed up. How do they get back into fellowship with Jesus Christ? Through the new covenant he tells what did he tell he tells them all in hebrews 8 he tells them hey you want to get back here's how we're going to do it now watch verse 4 and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that god is light and in him is no darkness at all how much darkness is in god None. So if you're walking in darkness, are you in God? No. How do you get in God in Israel's program? You got to be a part of that little flock, a believing remnant, and so forth. By the way, Paul tells you and I to be children of the light. We're not children of the night. We're not children of the darkness. We're children. Walk in light. How do you and I get to that point? We trust that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. (laughs) That's how we get it. Verse 6, if we say, watch this. 
If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all. If we say we're going to make a profession here, by the way, this is the first test in 1 John for the little flock in the tribulation, is a test of profession. If we say, and we're over here doing something, what are we? We're liars. We're in darkness. But we're not where? In fellowship. Did I lose you guys? You okay? All right, good. (laughs) If we say, verse 8, that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. (laughs) That's troubling, isn't it? Verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say... That we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. It's very clear what's the plea here for Israel to do. Confess who they are, what they are, and what's going on, and to return to who they're supposed to be. It's very clear. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Who's he talking to? My who? My little children. Who's that? Is that the church, the body of Christ? No, you're not child, you're the son. It's the little flock, it's the believing remnant. They're in rebellion. They're falling off. And he says, hey, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. These are justified people. And what are they looking like? And what are they acting like? They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They've broken the fellowship. He's telling Israel how to get back into fellowship with him. Now, one day they will. One day he will restore them. One day he will institute the new covenant and take care. But that's the fellowship of prophecy. Israel, you're here, and here's how you're going to get it now. Come back to Ephesians 3, because when he talks to you and I about the fellowship of what? The mystery. We have a different fellowship. It's not like Israel. It isn't the law, the if and the then. It isn't determined upon the new covenant. Rather, it's determined upon the program that God set up for you and I called the dispensation of grace, the church, the body of Christ. Israel was determined upon what God was going to do. We're determined on on part, we are determined on what God has already done. They're waiting. We're resting. They're moving towards it. We're already there. And if you look here at Ephesians 3, he says, verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Notice it's all men. We'll pick up in this. It's time to quit. Next time, the all men, there's no difference. He would have all men be saved. Matthew 10, the Lord commissions the 12 apostles, and he says, don't you go talk to that Gentile. Don't you go in the way of the Samaritans. Don't you go over there. You stay right over here to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Very limited. Now where are we going? All men. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the new covenant. Caught you, didn't I? By the what? By the gospel. Chapter 2, verse 16 and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Verse 19, because of that, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. We're fellow citizens. We're fellow heirs. We're partakers together. 1 Corinthians 1 will be finished here. 1 Corinthians 1.
Why? Because of what God's doing today, the dispensation of grace. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 9 is a wonderful verse kind of tucked up in here as Paul begins to deal with the uh, bad behavior of the Corinthians. And he says, God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God's chosen to do something today, folks, that he didn't do in prophecy. He never talked about it. He kept it secret. And he chose to take you and I, Gentiles, Gentile dogs, sinners, Greeks, barbarians, Scythians, and he chose to take us, and he chose to bring us into the fellowship of his son. And he did it by the cross. And as we begin to think about the big picture, as we begin to make all men see what is the fellowship of what? Of that. Look at what God's doing today, and let's be a part of that. We share in common everything based on His grace, based on what He's doing. And, and as God is forming the body of Christ today, He gives us an equal share in His death, burial, and resurrection. He gives us an equal share in the riches of His grace. We're wealthy beyond wealth can compare. And it's because we are in Christ. So where do you need to be? In Christ. How do I get into Christ? Just simply trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Place your trust, your faith in His death that He died for all. Why? Because all were dead. He died for the sins of the world. He died for everybody. He died for you. Then He was buried. Buried says... It's done. He's not alive. He's what? He's dead. But then on the third day, what did he do? He rose again. He says, ah, eh, not so quick. And the resurrection says that the sin debt is paid in full. You ever get a receipt and then it says it's paid in full? Sin, death, debt, you owe. His resurrection says that's been paid for. You trust Him. The moment you do, you're, you're taken out of Adam and you're placed into Christ. You're taken out of a life of bondage and weakness and just turmoil into a life of peace and joy and harmony. You're, you pass from death into life. You move into fellowship with His Son. Boy, that's what life's all about. And our job as ambassadors is to put all of that in visible, tangible means for the world around us to see, but then also that impact into the spirit realm. And we'll get into all that next time, okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. For the instructions here as we as go as we go as ambassadors, what we're to be doing and what we're all about, and what fellowship we're to have with one another in you. And we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory and everything that we say and do. For your name's sake, in your name we pray. Amen.